Okay. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. I'm look. I'm okay. I'm so excited. Okay. Wait. Okay. Can I look? Phineas Fleming Smith is getting ready for his first prom. His mom Trace and his stepdad Bunny are helping him, but Trace can barely contain her excitement. In fact, she might even be more excited than Finn. <gasps> ah! Oh my God! You look so handsome. <laughs> Look at you! Do you want me to retie your tie, please? Okay. Oh, look at you! <laughs> you need to turn around. Yes. Let Bunny tie your tie. Aww. Finn, how do you feel? <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that you look like you're being strangled a little bit, get your tie tied. <laughs> um, I'm excited, nervous. I got it. I did not got it. <laughs> Trace is really doing the most here. She's bought snacks for Finn's friends as they get ready at the house. They're ordering pizza, too. She's decorated the front porch with rainbow hearts and flags, and she has big plans for their prom photos on top of all of that. Trace is going above and beyond to celebrate her son and to make this moment special. That's because it's been a really hard year for Finn. Finn's home state of Alabama is targeting him and trans kids like him, but he's speaking up, and he's found himself in the middle of a nationwide battle over whether he and other trans young people can get what they need to be themselves. Hello, I'm Amara Jones. Welcome back to the anti-trans hate machine, A Plot Against Equality. This series explores the explosion in anti-trans bills that's happened throughout the country in just the last two years. And what I've learned since plunging into this topic is that it's all part of a larger plan by the far right. This last episode, we investigated the part of the machine behind the anti-trans sports bills, specifically a group called Alliance Defending Freedom. But there's another, even more ominous type of bill, and it should have us worried. These target life-saving medical care for trans teens. So where are these bills coming from? Alabama has been one of the battlegrounds for this dangerous legislation. So let's turn back to Finn. (laughs) Finn's been waiting to go on hormones for years, and the plan was to start once he turned 16. But that didn't happen. It's the one thing I wanted for my birthday. I know. Testosterone. I know. Yeah, the one thing the, the one thing I asked for. I didn't didn't want anything else. Why do you think it's so important to make you what why is it, why is it so important to you? I'm not comfortable in my own skin. Now Finn, his parents, stepdad, and doctors all agreed that going on testosterone was the next right move for him. And he was at the age where he could. But right before Finn turned 16, Alabama lawmakers made banning trans kids from getting the medical care they need a priority. When Trace first noticed it coming up in the Alabama State House in late 2020, she got a pit in her stomach. And then I looked, too, and saw on the Senate side of the pre-filed bills and saw Senate Bill 10. Mm -hmm. And I knew that they were identical. And that means trouble. Mm -hmm. If if they want to fast track something, they're going to drop it at the same time. And that's when we knew that that we were in for a bad fight. At the time when these bills were introduced, kids in Alabama could start getting gender-affirming medical care at puberty. Gender-affirming care for kids means the ability to go on puberty blockers and later, if it's right for them, hormone therapy. But these new bills would make providing gender-affirming care to trans kids a felony. Those who violate the law would face up to 10 years in prison and a fine of up to $15,000. And Trace couldn't imagine starting Finn on the care that he needed and then stopping. So they opted to hold off. But Trace wasn't going to sit idly by. She decided to fight against this law. And from her past advocacy work, she knew exactly how to push for change. I've been in the hallways of the state house and I've knocked on doors and have done all the things you're supposed to do to push, you know, positive, important legislation. And this is different than everything else. 
the outrage is so much deeper of how dare you? How dare you do this to my child, my child, who has done nothing, nothing but just want to be a kid. State Senator Shea Shelnut introduced the legislation to his colleagues at the beginning of this year. And to put it charitably, his rationale was misleading. This bill protects children. But it gets even worse. He decided to turn trans teens into a locker room joke. Last I checked, puberty is not a disease. Uh, I think we all went through that at one time. Some of us, it was probably rougher than others, right, Sir Nelson? <laughs> I mean, but last I checked, it's not a disease. It can be a confusing time, but hopefully most of us don't think the same way we did when we were 14. I know I don't. I didn't think that I could be surprised by how callous all of this is anymore, but he's making jokes about pushing his legislation that the American Medical Association suggested would likely increase the risk of suicides and hurt trans kids. Other leading medical organizations have come out against this kind of legislation, too, including the American Academy for Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, and more. Many more. But none of that matters to Senator Shelnut and his colleagues. They're hell-bent on going all the way. It's really frustrating. It's really upsetting. That's Finn again. I'm just trying to exist. I've got, I've got so many other things going on that I don't want to have to have this be a main focus when I, it's no one else's business. But Finn couldn't be silent about what was happening to him, so he chose to speak out. Do you want to go over your speech? It's April 2021. Finn's getting ready to speak at a Zoom press conference with the Human Rights Campaign. The internet's not working well at their home. Yeah, you know, we all know how that goes. So they had to drive to Trace's office. Are you okay? Are you okay? You were looking real green around the gills. I'm sorry. I'm gonna get some caffeine in you. Finn's barely responding here. He's almost catatonic. And they get to Trace's workspace at the college and the press conference starts. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thanks for joining us um, this afternoon. Uh, we're here to discuss SB10, the anti-transgender uh, medical care ban bill that's moving its way through the Alabama legislature. Then it's Finn's turn. Now, to be honest, it's a bit of a shaky start. And then the video cuts out. But he pulls it together and speaks with a moral clarity that only kids can. I do not want to be a pawn in a political agenda in which I was never consulted about. Representative Allen, Senator, Senator Shelnut, my parents have taught me that real men admit their mistakes. And I like to think that as legislators, you know this too. There's nothing shameful about in making a mistake. There's shame in not stopping a mistake that you know is hurting people. Step back from this. It's the right thing to do. Trace is on camera next to Finn. She's nodding along as he's talking, but she's looking down. She's still not sure if it's right for her son to be out here like this. I'm nervous. I'm really nervous. I don't know why. I don't know. I guess it's because... Am I pressuring Finn into doing this? I'm second-guessing. I guess that's the mom thing, but... Am I asking too much of him... Speaking up against injustice is the right thing to do, but when it's your kid, oh, it's it's one thing when it's me out, been in the press before, me speaking out, and it's another thing when it's your kid, you're just your 16 year old kid who just wants to be a kid. <sighs> My heart goes out to Trace's dilemma here. She's seen the toll that speaking out has taken on Finn, but she has even bigger concerns if the law passes. If they win, which, again, let's be realistic, they probably will, then we'll keep doing what we have to do in order to get him the medicine that he needs for the treatment that he needs. And if that's 
going to a different state, then that's what we'll do. And if that's moving forward and, and pushing to, to sue the state of Alabama, I, sure. I mean, nobody wakes up and goes, yeah, I can't wait to sue Alabama today. But, you know, I mean, but that's, that's exactly what I've we'll do. I've never been in a courthouse. I don't particularly want to be in one because I'm suing Alabama. I don't particularly want us to either, so I hope they choose right. These are their choices. To go through a gut-wrenching lawsuit or leave the only state that Finn's ever called home. It's weird and scary. I'm not supposed to be the spokesperson representative of, you know, trans people of my age group. I'm just trying to be a kid. And it's not working. I really would love it if I could just not exist on the radar for a while. Yeah. And it's nerve-wracking. But why did we decide that you should do it? Because no one else is gonna. Yeah. No. Not here, at least. I am the token trans person. (laughs) It is easy to see yourself as that. But it's also the case that you're standing up for yourself. And you're having to do that far sooner than you should. But it is also the case that standing up for yourself is something that you've always done. That by telling your parents, by telling your school, by having the bravery to be yourself, that you've always stood up for yourself. And so in some ways what you're doing is that, but it's just very public. And so I think that you have more bravery than you're giving yourself credit for. Oh, oh honey. I have to say, I really agree. (laughs) You're a really brave kid. But Finn shouldn't have to be brave. Adults are forcing him and trans kids in every corner of the country to be grown-ups faster than they ever should. That's because around 30 bills have been proposed banning young trans people from getting the medical care that they need. And in Oklahoma, there's a bill that's even worse. It bans this kind of care into adulthood. It was introduced by Oklahoma's state senator, Warren Hamilton. Under his proposal, anyone involved in helping a trans person under 21 years old gain access to gender-affirming care would face three years to life in prison and face up to $20,000 in fines. Yep, you heard that right. Anyone younger than 21. It's pretty draconian. Senator Hamilton saying in a press release, if a person is not mature enough to make the decision to use alcohol and tobacco responsibly, they are certainly not mature enough to make the decision to undergo irreparable and irreversible chemical or surgical procedures. This bill feels especially personal to Oklahoma Representative Jacob Rosecrans. His 13-year-old son is trans. I try to see both sides, and in this situation, I just don't think I can see. It's just born out of ignorance once again. This interview is the first time Jacob and Spencer are speaking up publicly. What was clear to me is that Spencer knows who he is. He came out pretty recently, just last year at the age of 12. But he's been thinking about and researching his gender identity since he was even younger. Well, I started digging into, like, um, like trans, uh, FTM, female to male, like, stuff. And I kept watching it, and I'm like, oh, oh, I relate with this. Like many kids, Spencer struggles with gender dysphoria. I guess I finally realized... Instead of just being, like, uncomfortable in my body and just, like, like, I am a boy. I want these things off my chest, please. <laughs> He's had to be this clear all along. When Spencer first came out, it was a mess. 
his dad actually showed him videos of gender reassignment surgeries to try to dissuade him. I know how horrible that is, but that's what happened. So your dad goes into your room and sits down and starts showing you videos. What did you think when that was happening, Spencer? I didn't really feel much. I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> it was kind of just my whole mindset. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's the way he's been this whole entire time. So, all right, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what really helped me understand is that Spencer was just like, okay, I know. All right, I'm a boy. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, okay, uh, oh, all right. And after that, Jacob started seeking resources to support his trans son. He's come a long, long way. If you want to have medical help to transition, make yourself feel more uh, acceptable to your body and your mind, then I want you to have the wherewithal to, to do that. Like with most families, these conversations about transition don't happen overnight. Where are you on decisions or conversations about anything medical? Where in your mind is the consideration of puberty blockers They just or a pause button so that your body doesn't change in any way until you get to the point of deciding what you want to do? I can actually start that? Mm-hmm. That's cool. We haven't crossed that bridge yet. This is our next big thing that we're going to dig into and try to figure it out. That's why Jacob is worried. Because all of this will get even more complicated if his colleagues in the Oklahoma State Legislature do what they want to do and take options away from his family. This just shouldn't be legislated at all. Like, period. Like, you can feel how you want to feel. It's free country. But don't legislate this. This shouldn't be a freaking law. It just blows me away. Blows me away. It blows me away, too. That's because transitioning as a teen, or at any age for that matter, is a very intricate, very involved process. Trust me. It varies person by person, and there's no one size fits all. It's a really individualized decision. That's Dr. Shauna Lawless. She works in Oklahoma with young trans people under the age of 25. And so we work with the patient and the families, um, plus or minus a mental health provider that may be involved, to decide what is the best time for the patient. Dr. Lawless cannot say enough about the impact that this medical care has on young people. I had one kid who was super, super anxious and had a hard time interacting with others. And his family was lovely and super supportive. Once we started him on testosterone, they came back for a visit a few months later and they were like, he's a different person. Like he's able to interact. Just it. It's transformational for these kids, and they are just so excited. This is like the only teenage population that's actually excited to come to the doctor. I mean, most teenagers are like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but like they come and they know that they're getting what they need. But these trans teens and their families have had their lives upended just by the introduction of these bills. They don't even have to pass to do damage. I had multiple patients where the parents were crying in my office worried that their kids who had already started transition weren't going to get the care they needed, weren't going to be able to see us any longer, um, and that we would refuse to prescribe them hormones after this or puberty blockers or whatever, and that they would be back to square one with a very distressed kid on their hands that's just not safe. And then how did you go about trying to respond or comfort those families who were reacting to the fear of this even being a possibility. I mean, so I told them I wasn't going to stop doing what I do, that I took a Hippocratic oath, that um, I will do no harm to my patients, and I feel that it would be harmful to stop treating these patients. Fortunately, the trans medical care legislation didn't even make it out of committee in Oklahoma. But it didn't matter. It wreaked havoc nonetheless and it will likely come up again in the next session. Carrie Davis of The Trevor Project says that these debates place trans youth in danger. Some people call our young people high-risk youth. I find that very unproductive. I like to think of them as young people that have been, been placed at risk. So these pieces of legislation are actually increasing their risk. These have the power to uh, destabilize young people, to place them in crisis, 
and to make them more likely uh, to attempt and complete suicide. Who would want to unleash this pain and anguish? My producer, Annie, called Senator Warren Hamilton to find out. He's the sponsor of the Oklahoma anti-trans medical bill. After she'd left over a dozen messages, his assistant called her back. This is Elaine with Senator Hamilton's office. How may I help you? Hi, did you just call me? This is Annie. I did. Okay. Annie, I can't, um, I can't speak 100% for Senator Hamilton, but I looked up your website mm-hmm. and probably guarantee that he will not be interested in doing this podcast. This is not a gotcha interview. That's not the kind of journalism we do. We really just wanted I to get I appreciate him. that. And I'm not saying that you're lying to me because I don't know you personally. Mm-hmm. But I know, I know that in the past, um, we, we've had that experience. And, you know, Senator Hamilton is not here to get his name out. He is a, a God-fearing man that is here that he feels that he's on a mission from God. God bless you and you have an awesome day, okay? Okay, thank you, bye. Bye Bye-bye. You can't say we didn't try. Eventually we traced the language in the draconian Oklahoma bill to a proposal in South Carolina. Representative Gary Smith is one of the co-sponsors of that bill. He agreed to an interview. Good morning, uh, Representative Smith. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm wondering if you've ever spoken to any of the youth um, that you proposed legislation would impact. Have you ever spoken to um, transgender teenagers? Have you ever spoken to the doctors that treat them? Um, Have you had in-depth conversations with their parents? Has that been a part of your process? Uh, Well, for one thing, I don't live in a cave. Uh, I do get out in society. I am a professor and talk to people in the community. Yeah, yes, sir, of course. But uh, the, the question is, have you done that specifically with transgender teens, their parents, and their medical professionals? I make myself available to everyone. I'm seeing a pattern. None of these lawmakers are even talking to trans people. And when I asked Gary if he had read the guidance from the American Medical Association or any of the other groups, for that matter, who had researched this, he wouldn't answer. But somehow Gary is convinced that supporting trans kids is dangerous. Not really, particularly when you see that uh, those sorts of uh, things, those sorts of major sorts of Removing body parts and other things like that are being pursued for for children younger than 18. And Gary can't even name an example of this happening, or a place in his district, or state, or even a neighboring state where it's an issue. But it is certainly important for us to take a look at and to consider in this discussion. You're just saying that you know from what you know that this exists, but you're not You can't remember a specific case that you can point to where that's the case. Gary said a lot of outrageous things during our conversation, but then he went a step even further. This is, again, a conversation that we need to be having, and I look forward to uh, having that robust exchange of ideas. And as Frederick Douglass Douglass said, use our freedom of speech to get those issues out there on the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, he was doing that in the context of slavery, which was very different, but I take your point on that. Now, Gary is just one lawmaker in one state, but all across the country, there are hundreds of Garys. So how do they all get the same idea at the same time? Well, it all started with a right-wing conference in October 2019 called the Summit on Protecting Children from Sexualization. Today's event is for everyone who cares about children. Transgender ideology is hastening children who are uncomfortable with their bodies down the path of sex reassignment, even though they may be too young to drive a car or to get a tattoo. And there was a panel specifically on trans healthcare. Lawmakers from all over the country were in the audience. So what what can be done about this? Well, I, I will say there's a little bit of conversation that that I think is worthwhile having around, do we ban the drugs? Do we actually go full out and we try to prohibit these procedures? And I can see the the merit in wanting to do that. Um, There are some difficulties that go along with that. Again, I think uh, that these these hormone therapies are 
uh, are, is child abuse when, when, you, when you truly look at them. Fred Deutsch was there. He's a state representative from South Dakota. And he saw the merit. Deutsch introduced the first viable anti-trans medical bill ever. And afterwards, bills started to proliferate all across the country. Now, the Summit on Protecting Children from Sexualization was organized by the Family Policy Alliance. We promote biblical citizenship by educating the electorate, advocating for pro-family legislation, engaging churches and mobilizing voters, and working to elect and train statesmen. The Family Policy Alliance is just one spinoff of an organization called Focus on the Family. You'll notice that these two groups, and so many others with the word family in their name, are the ones leading the push against equal access to medical care for trans kids. It's because they all come from one man, James Dobson. He's the one who created Focus on the Family, the parent organization, in 1977. James Dobson presents himself as the benevolent uncle of fundamentalist Americans. That's Ann Nelson. She's an expert on the far right and wrote the book Shadow Network, Media, Money, and the Secret Hub of the Radical Right. What people don't realize is that Dobson and his organizations and their their array of affiliates have this massive presence in American culture. Dobson was actually a psychologist. He gained notoriety as the host of a conservative radio advice program. It got to be so popular that he turned it into an actual organization, Focus on the Family. And it grew to be a massive machine, promoting a religious view of the world. So despite the innocuous name, Focus on the Family has a very rigid idea of what family should be, grounded in Christian fundamentalist ideology. For Dobson, this means the erasure of LGBTQ folks from public life. In fact, in the 1980s, his organization was one of the leading proponents of the idea that gays and lesbians were recruiting young people. And he became the godfather of the ex-gay movement, pumping money to groups of people who were declaring that they had left the lifestyle. Colorado Springs has kind of been ground zero, as they call it, a focal point for this struggle against uh, homosexual activists. But uh, it's coming to every city, every little town, uh, every city council, every school. Uh, this is something that's going to be uh, fought out, really, all across the nation, and people are just going to have to decide what they think about it. Dobson's doing so much advocacy that he starts to worry about the tax-exempt status of Focus on the Family his baby. So in a stroke of organizational genius, he comes up with the idea to create breakaway policy groups, which can lobby governments at all levels, pushing lawmakers to remake society in his image. And that's when he starts to clone Focus on the Family into groups like the Family Policy Alliance and the Family Research Council, and then dozens of affiliates in states all across the country. They're able to operate as stealth because the, the professional news media treats them as independent grassroots organizations, and they're actually cogs in a machine. Their efforts seem organic, but there's nothing natural about them. We called a bunch of these organizations, and none of them would talk to us. Dobson was the dominant force behind this movement for decades. But in 2003, something starts to happen. The center of gravity begins to move to his protege, Tony Perkins. Perkins takes over the Family Research Council. Tony Perkins fascinates me um, in a dark way. That's Ann Nelson again. Now, Tony Perkins was born in Oklahoma. He got his start as an anti-abortion activist and a local news commentator and as a cop. Go figure. But then he became a state lawmaker in Louisiana. Dobson brought him in for the Family Research Council in the early 2000s, and I, they found him to be mediagenic, and he's almost been developed as um, their kind of anchor man. That's not a surprise. Perkins had practice in front of the cameras. He has kind of a boyish appearance and a kind of down-home, aw oh, shucks, approach to issues, and he makes it sound like these radical policies are 
gosh darn it, just a matter of common sense. Can you believe those crazy Democrats? And, and so I, I believe he must be fairly effective because they promote him uh, uh, quite energetically. And he's the face of the movement. Perkins picks up Dobson's anti-LGBTQ mission and puts it on steroids. He recognizes that Dobson's approach wasn't actually stopping gay people from moving more and more into the heart of American life. So Perkins doubles down on the issue that he thinks could roll all this progress back, same-sex marriage. And he adds more money and more mobilization to this fight, confident that it's a line of acceptance that Americans will not cross a line in the sand. Perkins thought that the mere prospect of same-sex marriage would show that LGBTQ rights had gone too far and had to be halted. I'm not going to be silent while they try to redefine marriage in this country, change policy, what my children are taught in schools, and what religious organizations can do. I'm not going to be silent, nor are millions of other Christians across this country. Every time this has gone through the ballot box, Americans understand the definition of a marriage is what it's been for 5,000 years. It's the union of a man and a woman. After the Supreme Court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage in 2015, much to his surprise, Perkins needed a new plan. He needed a last-ditch effort to stop LGBTQ rights. And it was something that he was sure that most of America would get behind, an anti-trans agenda. Perkins knows that most people in the country don't know us, don't know anybody who's trans. That makes our community ripe for misinformation. And at the heart of his propaganda are concerns about trans kids. We don't even know the long-term implications and health effects related to the usage as they're currently being used um, in these uh, children. That's him on his nationally syndicated radio program talking about the medical bans for trans youth. He's spreading misinformation again. This, I think, is a prudent measure that simply protects children from making a decision that is influenced by momentary feelings. On his show, Perkins announces that the Family Research Council is pushing these anti-trans medical bills nationally. Uh, FRC has some model legislation as it pertains to this topic um, because it is a big issue. He's firing on all cylinders with this issue. Under him, the Family Research Council has been designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Margaret Wong is the center's president. She says Tony Perkins and the Family Research Council are deeply concerning because of the way that they deploy their hate. When we talk about hate and extremist groups, people often think of groups who turn out on the streets carrying guns and threatening people. Family Research Council is a policy organization. They wear suits. They go to Capitol Hill and lobby. But their threat is so significant because they're trying to transform policy based on the same hate and extremist views as the groups who are out, you know, marching in the streets. In the last year, all of these groups that we've been talking about have come together under an even bigger umbrella. Promise to America's children. And it's a new coalition of over 60 right-wing groups pushing the anti-trans agenda even further. And they're obsessed. This obsession is why there's no stopping these attacks on our very right to exist as trans people. There's no end in sight. The anti-trans hate machine is actually learning from its past failures. And it has no intention of letting this go. In fact, it's ramping up. And that's why kids like Finn Fleming Smith in Alabama have suffered. Promise to America's Children and its affiliates are the ones driving this hate in Alabama. Despite everything that they're throwing at this, though, there's some good news for Finn. He can move forward with getting testosterone. That's because the bill didn't pass. But just barely. So Finn and his mom, Trace, are hoping to get his first prescription later this summer. His feelings about it all, though, are more complicated than you might expect. The emotions are mixed and confusing. Um, I'm happy. I'm, I'm just... It's a lot. I guess it does kind of can mesh the, the feelings of, you know, just of how I've felt 
because of the bill and how I'm going to feel when I do eventually start this. And it's just... I don't know. I wonder how much this connects with you not being exuberant. They kind of robbed you of some of the joy that should be a part of this. I I wonder how you'll feel once that first injection happens and if the euphoria, the joy of it comes through. I don't know. This hurts me so much. Finn's about to embark on a big milestone after winning a monumental victory against the machine, but he's defeated. Just the talk about this issue inflicts severe pain. We don't even know the damage. But when these bills pass, it's sheer hell. Trans kids in two states are grappling with that reality. And kids like Finn, who managed to avoid the worst this year, they're worried about what next year will bring. I mean, I don't want to think about it. I don't want it to come up again, but it's probably going to come up again if they were so being hard asses about it. If this comes back up next year, even if you're already taking testosterone, will you think about speaking up again? Yeah, probably. As much as I didn't care for it. uh, If I have to step up again, I'll do it, but begrudgingly do it because this is stupid and doesn't need to come up again. This episode has been hard because these issues are so personal and these are kids. Despite how gut-wrenching all of this is, though, we have to remember that these anti-trans medical bills basically come out of a single session at a one-day event, the Summit on Protecting Children from Sexualization the massive collection of self-replicating, self-reinforcing family groups turned this single conversation into a massive attack on trans kids in nearly every single corner of the country. It's truly dystopian. But if that wasn't enough, there's one other group that's one of the main sources of Promise to America's Children. It's another arm of the anti-trans hate machine, and it plays a very specific and a very influential role. We'll explore that group in our next episode. Heritage is a way to smuggle ideas into the political debate. There was direct collaboration to the ends of a consistent government position undermining the rights and very existence of transgender people. You could be having a heart attack and then they leave you there to die in the emergency room because of their religion. Next time on the anti-trans hate machine, a pot against equality. Thank you.